there. We're going to be in John chapter 6. If you go ahead and find that in your Bibles this morning. John chapter 6. We are in the middle of uh, a longer discourse by Christ. Uh, we picked up uh, a couple weeks ago after Jesus had fed the 5,000 and crossed over the sea. And uh, we saw that crowd followed him the next day. And they, they found him there in the synagogue. And uh, it was in that passage where Jesus says that he is the bread of life. And he offered to them eternal life if they would come see and believe in him. And that's really kind of where we left off last week uh, at the end of verse 40. So today we're going to pick up in verse 41. And in verse 41 of John chapter 6, it says, The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Anyone, eat, anyone eats, if anyone, excuse me, eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So Jesus continues trying to help this crowd who was looking for another free meal from Jesus. Uh, understand that when he's talking about the bread of life, he's talking about himself. He's, he's trying to explain to them um, still that he's the one that came down from heaven. In other words, he's the Savior, he's the Messiah, he is the source of eternal life. And right off the bat, we see something that should be really common. Folks who are religious complaining. Right? Isn't that what happens in verse 41? All these religious folks, they know all about God, they know all about the scripture, they've been following, looking for God, celebrating what, what God's doing through Jesus, and then Jesus says, but I'm not who you think I am. I'm not going to do things the way you think I'm going to do them, and they start complaining. They even really go so far as to make fun of them, right? Like, you say you come down from heaven, but we know your daddy. And we know your daddy's mom and daddy. We know where you come from. You didn't come from heaven, you came from Joseph. Right? I mean, that's, they're, they're really kind of mocking him in this sense. And then Jesus begins to explain to them again what he's been trying to teach them. And I wish today we really had the chance to dig deep into every single part of this passage, but I can't do it. Because I get stuck on one verse in this passage. As a matter of fact, I've been so stuck on this verse that at 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon, I took my entire sermon and, and hit the delete button on it. Got rid of it. And so it was a really early morning this morning. Oh, um, <laughs> verse 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Anybody remember the Dirty Harry movies? Anybody remember what gun Dirty Harry used? 44 Magnum, a couple of y'all said it, right? <laughs> you might you may bring it up to call out the model. Oh, uh, there we go. Smith & Wesson Model 29, 44 Magnum. It's this beauty that's about to pop up on the screen right here, right? That's a gun. That's a whole lot of gun, right? Uh, if you remember, in Dirty Harry, if you saw the movie, uh, Dirty Harry says it was the most powerful handgun in the world, which maybe back then it was. It's not anymore by far. They have guns now, handguns now. I think two or three people have to hold to shoot one of those things. But, um, you know, he's got his famous line that eventually comes after, you know, did I shoot five or six times, you know, go ahead and make my day, you know, eventually comes along. But um, I wanted to put this up for a visual today, because we're going to spend really the rest of the morning talking about verse 44, 44 Magnum, verse 44. But also because it doesn't matter who's holding that gun, if they know how to operate that gun, they are on equal level with everybody else that knows how to operate that gun. 
It doesn't matter how big or how small or how fast or how strong or any of those other things. The tiniest person versus the biggest person, that gun is an equalizer, right? Uh, when it comes to gunfights, if you know how to use a gun, you're on equal footing with everybody else. And this verse to me is a reminder to us. It's one of those verses, there's several of them in the scripture, that reminds us that we are on equal footing when it comes to salvation. That there is not one person that has the market on it. There's not one person that brings something more or has some advantage to salvation over another person. That we all start off and end up in the same place, right? That the, 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 the ground at the foot of the cross, as people say sometimes, is the devil. Nobody comes because their parents or grandparents or, or, or were great Christians or because they went to the right church or those other things. We all come with nothing. And this verse kind of reminds me of that. Now, I will also tell you that if you come across a single person that says they can read John 6, and understand that in this process of salvation completely, and they know every little thing about it, every red flag that you have should go up. I think we can study the process of salvation the rest of our lives, and there still will be a mystery to part of it. Because part of it is God, and part of it is us. And God doesn't reveal everything that he does and how this whole process works, including this idea of drawing us. But we know that it's true because it's the word of God. God said it happens, and we have faith that, that the word of God is true. We believe that it's infallible. So I may understand exactly how it happens, but I do know that it happens. And so today, I really don't have much of a choice other than maybe take you through the weird world of Rusty's head. And kind of show you where I've been, what rabbit hole I've been going down with verse 44 of John chapter 6 today. Now before we get there, I want to take you over to Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5, it's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And Matthew chapter 5, it starts off, in, and if I remember right, it says, uh, And he saw the multitudes, and Jesus went up on the mountain, and he sat down, and the disciples came, and he began to teach them, and say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. So, I'll reveal my hand a little bit on the Beatitudes. I believe the Beatitudes show the Christian life from beginning to end. Because it begins with being poor in spirit. In the last Beatitude, uh, it talks about being blessed when people persecute you, when they say evil things about you, when they revile you uh, for my name's sake. And it ends with those same phrase, for yours is the kingdom of heaven, right? Uh, so in other words, it starts off being poor in spirit, and as you grow and develop, you become so much like Christ that the world begins to hate you because you look like him. And that's what that process of sanctification looks like in this whole thing, that process of spiritual growth. My problem with the Beatitudes is not the end, it's the beginning. Blessed are the poor in spirit. How do you become poor in spirit? Jesus doesn't tell us in the Beatitudes how to become poor in spirit, does he? He just starts blessed with the Holy Spirit. He never leads up to it. It's the starting point there. So how do we get there? Because naturally, you and I are not poor in spirit. We are not destitute in our spirit on our own. Something has to get us to this point to where we are poor in spirit. We're not born that way, and on our own, we'll never get that way. 30 years ago, when little fat chubby Rusty walked into Poplar Corner Baptist Church in Brownsville, Tennessee, looking for his free cookies and Kool-Aid, he had no idea that anything was wrong with him. He was most definitely not destitute in spirit. He was not poor in spirit. He wasn't looking for the spiritual. He was looking for some cookies and some Kool-Aid. That was it. And after three years of hearing about what sin is and hearing about who Jesus is, eventually I came to the point where I realized I was that sinner. There was sin in my life, and I was powerless to do anything about it. And the only person who could do anything about it was Christ. And until I submitted myself to him, I was going to be someone who was dead in my sin, right? And eventually, I put my faith in Christ because of it. But something happened between the time that I walked into that church for the first time, and three years later when I finally gave my life to Christ, to get me from being absolutely oblivious to my sin to being someone who was poor in spirit. And it wasn't because I decided I was going to be that way. I didn't just wake up and make up my mind, you know what, today I'm going to be poor in spirit. I didn't even decide I was going to be, I was going to try to do better. You ever try to do better? It's February 15th. How are those New Year's resolutions working out, right? I can't tell you how many times this year already I was going to start eating better and exercising more. 
uh, you know, it's always going to be on Monday. I don't know why Monday is the day, but it's always going to be on Monday. But none, that Monday still hadn't come yet. Uh, you know, uh, it just had work, right? I mean, it's not even about necessarily doing better. Something has to happen because I can't do it on my own. And I think that's part of what this verse points to. And so I've got some questions about this verse. That I want us to look at. And one of the first questions is, is, what does it mean to be drawn by the Father? What does that mean? And I'll tell you that this is another one of those passages in Scripture. We've seen a lot of it. John 6, in of itself, has three or four of these already that we've explored. We've already had some of them in some of the previous chapters. This is a spot where we begin to see God's sovereignty and man's responsibility come together in the same spot. We see it over and over and over. And that's part of this idea of drawing, right? Uh, now, before we get to, to talking about the actual drawing, we've got to realize who man is, right? Man, in his natural state, apart from God, is unrighteous. Right? Romans 3, 10, 11, uh, there are none righteous, no, not one. None that understand, none that seek after God, right? Nobody. Nobody on their own would seek after God. Is what is what Romans tells us, uh, Paul writes, writes that in Romans chapter 3. In Romans, a few chapters earlier, he also writes that God reveals himself to us in a, in a general way in creation. Right? We call it general revelation. So through creation, God has put himself out there to where we can look at that creation and say, where did this come from? Right? Uh, we can say, ask questions like that, but eventually just the fact that there is a God. Right? But then Paul goes on to Romans 1 and says, we even reject that, right? We don't want to have anything to even do with that. Nature is trying to tell us there is a God, and we say, nope, no thank you. I don't believe it. And so, Scripture paints us as people who are depraved. People who are caught up in our sin. People who don't want righteousness by nature. But then we get to verse 44. And Jesus says, God draws us, and that one day, that's the beginning of the process, and that one day Jesus is going to finish the process when he raises us up. That's the process, all in one verse. And we see this word draw, and I really think it's important to try to understand what the word draw itself means in order to understand this verse. Now, in Scripture, there's, there's several different meanings that we can get for, for this word in the, in the Greek. Uh, and we see it in the New Testament. Uh, in several different places. In Greek, it's the word uh, elkuo. Uh, it's found in, uh, uh, I think, uh, five places uh, in the New Testament there. Four of those are in John. The other spot's in Acts, uh, where we see that, that word used over and over again. And in some places, it means this idea of, of to pull or to drag. Uh, one spot's used where Peter pulls out the sword, right? You will cut off the guy's ear of the guard, right? He, he pulls it out. He draws it out. He draws the sword out. Uh, one spot talks about uh, drawing the net, so grabbing the net full of fish on the boat and dragging the net in. Uh, but there are two places in John where it doesn't really appear to fit so much. One here is in uh, chapter 6, verse 44. The other is in chapter 12, verse 32, uh, where we have a little bit more figurative language in the context. I mean, this whole passage, the bread of life, is very figurative in nature, right? Jesus isn't saying he's literally bread, right? He's not saying get out your butter and butter me up and enjoy me like that. It's figurative language that he's using this in. Chapter 12, it's the same type of deal. And you see, another definition of the word draw there in the Greek is this word to attract. Anyone ever drawn your attention? It's Valentine's Day. You should say your spouse if you're close to them. Uh, you know, it says anybody ever attracted you, drawn your eye, or maybe your heart? Uh, those kind of things, right? It's the same kind of idea that that draw, that attraction, uh, is really what it appears to be talking about here in verse 44. And the reason why we know that is because of the context. See, all through chapter 6 of John, eternal life is spoken of as a gift, right? A gift that's received for believing in Christ. We saw this in, in verses 27 through 29. We saw it again in verses 32 through 35. Uh, verse 40 last week. Verse 47 and 51 this week. They all talk about this idea of a gift of receiving eternal life from Christ. John even tells us the motive behind this whole gift, right? Three chapters earlier, one of the world's most famous verses, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, right? That's it. He gave the gift out of his love. 
And so Jesus, in explaining his role here, he talks about this idea of God drawing people to him and his role of salvation. But over in chapter 12, he gives us a little bit of a, of a clearer picture. In chapter 12, verse 32, he says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This he said, signifying what death he would die. So Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up, I'm be crucified, right? I'm going to hang on a tree. If I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Now, something should sound odd to me on this one, or it should sound odd to you too. I will draw all people to myself. Now, historically, verse 44 has been one of those argued verses in John chapter 6. Uh, where people have used it for uh, teaching of, of Calvinism, just for lack of a better word, for teaching this idea that, that God has selected some for heaven and some for hell, and that's it, right? And they would say that verse 24 says that, that God said, that Jesus is saying God's going to draw people to him, when he draws them, they're going to accept him. But in chapter 12, Jesus says the same language. He says, I'm going to draw all men to myself. Now, you and I know that not all people put their faith in Christ. We know that, very clear. We have pictures even in the Bible of people dying going to hell because they didn't put their faith in Christ the way they're supposed to. So something is wrong with that definition then if we look at verse 44 and say that it's saying that only those who God draws are going to be saved, right? That, that everyone who's saved are the ones that are drawn. The ones that, that don't get saved are, aren't drawn by God. Uh, there's a difference there, right? So we need to understand chapter 12 verse 32 and verse 33, I think to better understand where we are today. So here's where it is. We need to understand that in our Bibles, where it says, I will draw all people to myself, the word people isn't in the original Greek. It's Advian because in English, we wouldn't say, I draw all, I draw all to myself, right? It doesn't really sound right. Uh, it would make any of you that, that love the, the English language cringe a little bit, uh, because that's not how we speak. So we've added the word people in there to give some clarity. So Jesus in, in chapter 12 could be speaking about Drawing all people meaning Jews and Gentiles. So God's, God's elect versus, versus those who were not considered the elect in the Old Testament, right? Uh, God's people versus those who were not part of that yet. Or it could be speaking of uh, the extent of Christ's work providing for all people, right? Provides all of that. Um, and we know that as he does that, some people will accept him, some people will refuse him. And either way it goes... What we see Jesus talking about in chapter 12 isn't this idea of compulsion of dragging somebody to Jesus and saying you're going to accept him one way or the other. Instead, it's this idea of, of a moral pool on the inner part of man. It's this leading that happens. A similar reference happens in John chapter 3. It seems like everybody knows John 3.16. Hopefully, as a church, we're beginning to learn John 3, 17, because I've quoted a lot, because it's my favorite verse of all time. But John 3, 14 and 15, most of us have no clue what it says. It's the whole context, it's the thing that leads up to for God, if God so loved the world, right? It's talking about what happens in the book of Numbers when uh, the serpents, the, the snakes, I should say, I would say the, the, the name of the snake, but it always sounds like I'm saying a dirty word, A-S-P-S. I can't say that word. I can't get the P out of it. Uh, so it always sounds like I'm saying something I shouldn't be saying. But uh, in, that, in that story, Moses is holding up the staff with the serpent wrapped around it. And those that are bitten by the snakes are told that if they will look at the staff, uh, that they will be healed, right? That they won't die from the snake bites. And that's the reference before John 3.16. That's the reference that we're moving into really into this entire section. This idea of, of being able to choose whether or not they looked in faith at that staff or not. In this case, whether or not they will look unto Jesus to be the author and the perfecter of their faith, right? We're able to look to him in faith to, breathe, to be the bread that he's talking about, the bread of life. So then, maybe a question that comes out of this, then, and maybe even a better question is how? How does this whole thing work? How does the Father draw us to Jesus? Well, I think there are a lot of things that we can point to, but there's one in particular that I think is the, the foundation of it all. Look at verse 44. If I can find verse 44, there is. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent him draws me, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
Now look what he says about it. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Jesus just gave us the answer to the how. He says, the teaching of God's word is designed to draw people to Christ. And that's exactly what follows after verse 44, right? Uh, there's this quote from, from, from Isaiah chapter 54, uh, and talking about uh, everyone, uh, will, will, uh, they will all be taught by God. Uh, that reference is, is really in context, uh, a few verses earlier, about uh, God wooing Israel back to himself like a man woos a, woos a woman to be his wife. In other words, it's about courtship, right? Now, a lot of you have been married for a long time. Some of you haven't been married for so long. But I can promise you that none of you got married by like clubbing your spouse over the head and dragging them to the altar to get married, right? It didn't happen. Some of y'all may still act like you did, but it did. Uh, but nobody wants to be married really to somebody who doesn't want to, to, to come and marry them, right? Like I didn't walk down the road and say, okay, Corey, you're going to marry me today. And she's like, uh uh, right? There was this courtship, right? There was this wooing. There was this drawing that happened in our relationship with each other until we got to the point where we said, you know what, this is right. You know, let, let's marry each other. That's the context that he's quoting from here from Isaiah 54 is God wooing Israel to be drawn to him and fall back in love with him. So therefore, this idea of compulsion, of dragging and making you do something isn't even part of that context. Instead, we see that it's a choice. And he gives us the process, right? God teaches, he says, and then people hear and learn. That's what it says in verse 45. God teaches, people hear, they learn, and then they respond by coming to Christ for salvation. See, he talks about uh, this idea of, of coming to Christ. All through John, we've been seeing this phrase. And over and over and over again, when we see that phrase, it really is talking about salvation every single time. Uh, whether it's in uh, chapter 5, verse 40, or earlier here in chapter 6, uh, we also want to see it in chapter 7, the next chapter, this idea of coming to Jesus for salvation. And it's only those who have listened and learned that will end up believing. Well, what are they being taught? What are they hearing? What are they learning? And the simple answer is the gospel. The gospel message. They're learning that we are all sinners. And the wages of our sin is death. They're learning that that God loved us so much to send Christ to this earth to be born of Mary, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to, be, uh, to, to die, uh, be buried, three days later to, be, to, to rise from the dead, uh, to come and, and show himself to hundreds of people, then to rise to ascend in the right hand of the Father, where one day he's coming back after his children. It's the gospel message that is the core thing that God uses to draw us. And this is the reason why I get so frustrated with American preaching sometimes. If you want to hear the gospel message, it's really hard to hear by turning on a preacher on TV these days. We hear a whole lot of social justice, a whole lot of social gospel, a whole lot about how we can be really good people and live really good lives and treat people fair and do all these kinds of things. We hear a whole lot about prosperity gospel and about how God wants us to have all these great wonderful things. But when it comes to just the flat out straight preaching of the gospel, we are anemic in, Ameri in the American church. But yet, if this is the primary thing that God uses to draw people to himself, then it shouldn't surprise us the fact that we have less true believers, I hate to use the word true because it really isn't an untrue believer, less believers in America than we've ever had before. We have more contact with more people from around the world today than ever. Yet in the Southern Baptist Convention, our numbers haven't been this low since 1939. We've had less baptisms than we've been there. That's crazy. But it's because we've lost this foundation. And if that's the foundation God is using to draw people to himself, then how important it should be to you and I as believers to make sure we are getting that gospel message out. So God uses the gospel. And we know that people are going to reject Christ, Right? Even all back in chapter 5, in chapter 5, Jesus tells the, the Pharisees there that, that they read the words of Moses and they're looking for life, but now they're rejecting even the words of Moses, right? People will reject God. They have been doing it, uh, and they always will. But there are some that won't. 
Because we know that the gospel is the power of salvation, right? So we're supposed to be preaching it and teaching it and having it on our, on our lips constantly so that people can hear it, they can learn from it, they can obey. God also uses the Holy Spirit in this process to draw men. In John 16, it says that the Holy Spirit says, And when He, the Holy Spirit, has come, He will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. So, as Christ, as God is, is, is drawn men to Christ, and as Christ is leading men, uh, men of each of the Father, which we'll look at in just a minute, the Spirit is responsible for taking the Word of God and using it to expose our sin. Right? Helping us to see the truth of what's being taught. The Spirit uses uh, divine persuasion, if you will, to, to convince us, to, to, to reprove us, to disturb us, to, to draw us. To show us God's love. But that doesn't guarantee that everybody who's convinced of the truth is going to say yes to Christ. Some are still going to reject it. We saw that in John chapter 5. We're going to see that next week when we get to the very next passage. That this same group of people who saw Jesus do some of the most incredible things are going to say no to him. God also uses people to draw men. This is where we come in at. This is our part. We are, we are agents. God uses us to teach the Word of God. That Word that the Holy Spirit convicts us of. And when you think about it, that's really what the majority of the New Testament is about. We see Jesus teaching the Gospel message. But then when we get to the epistles, that's really what we see over and over and over again. I mean, think about just Paul alone, right? He looks at the church in court in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says the first thing uh, that he made known to them was the gospel. Before he went and told them how to build a church, what songs to sing, how to do this, how to get their life right, how to stop being addicts, how to get their money right, how to do all these other things. He said the primary, the first thing I ever taught you was the gospel. That was the center and the foundation of it all. You go on in Romans chapter 10 and says, how then... Uh, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? He says, it's important for us to allow ourselves to be the agents of the gospel that God has called us to. See, we talk about the mission of the church being the great commission. Going and making disciples. But when you look at what most believers spend their time doing, there's very little of that actually happening. There's very little gospel presentation happening. There's very little talk about the gospel. We're good at inviting people to church. Nothing wrong with inviting people to church. Keep inviting people to church. But that's not the gospel. That's not the message. Because you know as well as I do, some of those folks may come every once in a while, but the majority of the people who invite to church, they ain't coming. You want to know why? I wouldn't either if I was lost. Why would I come and sit around a bunch of people listening to something that I don't understand if I was lost as a ball on my wings? I got better things to do on Sunday. It's Daytona Day. Uh, even though I wouldn't watch it, if I was lost, I'd rather watch Daytona. I'd rather watch cars drive in a circle for hours uh, than, than go to church, right? It just makes more sense. I'd rather sit at home and read the newspaper and be depressed. It's not our job just to invite folks to church. It's our job to take this gospel message and tell them about it. So what happens? What happens here in verse 44 when God draws people to Christ? What is that all about? What does that look like? I think it's important to admit that God is the one who initiates this entire process. He's the one that provides the way of salvation through Christ. He's the one who provides the faith necessary for us to, to believe in Christ. Every part of the process is really just due to, to God's grace. But there is a human response that we have to have. We are, we are left in the spot where Jesus brings us and says, I mean, God brings us to, to Jesus and says, what are you going to do with him? Are you going to say yes or are you going to say no? Are you going to accept him or are you going to reject him? That choice is the part that hurts. Jesus said, God is going to draw us to the Son. It says, there he is. And then he steps back. 
what are you going to do? I think we see this really well in two passages in John. So we got this one right here, John 6, 44. But over in John 14, 6, pretty familiar passage, I think, for a lot of us. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Wait a minute. Jesus says in John 14, no one comes to the Father but through me. But he says in 644 uh, that no one comes to me except through the Father. Which is it, Jesus? Which one? And the answer is yes. It's both, right? That's really the answer. Is that they're both right. Uh, I wish I had a, a graphic here to show you this. It's just a circle, right? God brings you to Jesus. Father brings you to Jesus. You see Christ. You make a decision one or the other. If you make that decision to put your faith in Christ, then Christ puts you in, brings you to the Father. It's at the end of verse 44. The end of verse 44. The last call says, I will raise him up at the last day. Literally, he will bring you to the Father. Literally. It's one big cycle there. See, belief in God has to precede a belief in Jesus, right? That's part of that drawing. It's God, I believe you enough that I'm willing to go and take a look at Jesus, but whether or not I like Jesus or not, we'll, we'll find out when I get there. Okay? Now I've got to make a decision. If you want to see a good picture of this, I think maybe a good example of what John 6.44 is showing us, this drawing, uh, is the story of Lydia. Acts chapter 16. We found Lydia, and she goes to a prayer meeting. <coughs> and we'll stop right there. Why would she go to a prayer meeting? As much as I love Wednesday night Bible study, Sunday night, as much as I love all the prayer meetings I've been to over, over the years, different churches I've pastored, there were none of them that I went to just for fun. Like, like what, does, what got in the lady where she said, I want to get up today and I'm going to go to this prayer meeting, right? This is drawing and choices, right? God's saying there's a prayer meeting and drawing, opening up her heart and mind the idea of going to that meeting, and then she has a choice to say yes or no, just like people had today to say yes or no when God was drawing them, saying it's time to go to church. It's time to gather with the body and worship. They have a choice, yes or no. Same thing, Lydia has that choice, being drawn by God. Then she hears Paul teach. What's he teaching? Somebody say it, please. Thank you, the gospel. I'll just make sure you're still away. Uh, <laughs> So Paul's preaching the gospel. That's what Lydia hears. And then in verse 14 in the back 16, it says, The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. <coughs> so now all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's at work through the human agent Paul, through the divine inspired word of God. And Lydia gives her life to Christ. That's what it looks like when God draws us. God worked, Paul taught the Spirit, the Spirit convicted, and Lydia responded. Now each one of us have that same decision to make every single day. For some, it's the decision as to whether or not I'm going to put my faith in Christ. The good news is, is that the first time you say no isn't the last opportunity you'll have, hopefully. That God continues to give you those opportunities to say yes to Christ while you're alive. Amen. But for those who have already said yes to Christ, every day we still have more opportunities to say yes or no to Christ on our own. Am I going to do what, what Lydia does? Lydia follows right after that with baptism. Baptism was not part of her salvation. Baptism was her first step of obedience after her salvation. God said, do it as a public way to, to connect with me, as, as your public profession of faith, as a way to show the world that you belong to me, and she did it. See, for the believer, we have a chance to say yes or no to obedience every single day after our conversion. From day one to the last day you take breath on earth. There are some things we may not understand. Some things we may say, you know what, God, I don't know if this is what you want me to do or not do. I get that. Careers, family issues, money matters, all those kind of things. Sometimes we sit there like, I just really don't know what God wants me to do. But there are some things we know very clearly spelled out in the Word of God that He calls us to do. <coughs> what he does one of them, baptism after his salvation. Going and making disciples. All the one another commands in Scripture. All those loving for one another, warning with one another, doing all those things. It's all things that we know God has called us to do. And we have a choice every time we come across one of those in Scripture. We have a choice every time we open our eyes up in the morning. Am I going to say yes to Him or am I going to reject 
God has drawn me to this place, and he's continuing to draw me until that, that time of which uh, my redemption is fulfilled, when I go to be with Christ, and our body is raised up, and it's all said and done. Until that day, am I going to keep saying yes to him? See, for a lot of us, I think the first time we say yes to Christ for salvation, we just kind of stop. I'm done. Got what I wanted. It's like when I go shopping. If you're a person that likes to like mosey around the store and like window shop, and kind of look, you do not want to go with me. I worked in a mall in college during Christmas. I have learned the art of knowing exactly where it is before I walk in the door, going straight there and getting it and getting out. I am not fun to shop with. Just not that person, right? I want to get there and get over with it. And soon I'm done, I'm done shopping. I don't think about it anymore. I don't have buyers anymore. It's done. It's over with, right? Some of us treat salvation like that. Like, okay, I heard it, I believed it, now I'm done, got my ticket, it's in my back pocket, just waiting for Jesus to come back, and I'm, 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 I'm out, right? That's the start. I told you Beatitudes, I believe, or show us this process of sanctification. It keeps going. You keep hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You keep being broken over your sin. And you keep growing and progressing until you get to the point where you are so much like Christ that, that the world doesn't love you anymore. I mean, one of the signs that we have been drawn by Christ and said yes to Christ is the fact that, that our desire for the flesh that we used to have and our disdain for the spiritual things that we used to have have flipped. We now have a desire for spiritual things and, and disdain for the things of the world. That should be where we're headed in our lives. We should hate the things of the flesh once we give our life to Christ because we know those things take us away from God. Sin should break us. So this morning, I'll present that to you, that same question. There's no doubt to me that God is drawing you. The question is, what are you going to say to him? Maybe he's drawing you for salvation, or are you going to say yes or no to him? Are you going to say yes, I'm going to turn away from my sins and put my faith in Christ? It's really simple. So the scripture says that, that if we will call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. It's a matter of praying to him. Being to him that you're a sinner. Being to him that you can't do it on your own, right? That's really what we're admitting at that point. That he's right. That we have messed up. We can't do anything about that. But also admitting that Jesus can. That Jesus can take care of that sin. And, and, and committing to a life of following Christ, right? Putting our faith in him that what he said is true. And, saying, and admitting that we're going to follow him. We're going to turn from sin. Some of you here may need to make that decision. Just a minute, I'll give you a chance to do that during the time of, of, uh, of response this morning. But some of you have already made that decision. You need to ask yourself, is my life every day, is it reflective of the fact that I'm saying yes to Christ? Or does my life look like I'm saying no to Christ day after day? Can God use me in what I'm doing day to day, the things that I say, the places I go, the, the actions that I commit? Is He going to use those things as a conduit to draw people to Him, or am I being a hindrance in the gospel? And if it's the latter, we have a problem. If it's the latter, then this is the time to take care of that. Don't wait. Don't get so frustrated that you throw your hands up and say, I just give up. One of the most beautiful verses in the Bible that, that, that are outside of salvation directly itself is, is that God's mercies are new every day, right? That's a beautiful thing. I mean, just because you messed up yesterday, you look back over your life, even this past week or month or whenever, and you say it's not where I need to be, God says, it's not too late. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to give you the grace you need to change that. Maybe a day during our time of response, you just need to spend some time praying to God. Praying and just giving some things over to him. Maybe it's a time of rededication that's needed. Maybe it's uh, for you to say yes in obedience to him. Maybe you look at God and just say, you know, God, I'm sorry. I haven't been a conduit of the gospel. I haven't been allowing you to use me to draw on the people. Maybe it's that you don't necessarily feel like you've been stopping people, but just that you've been neutral. That's not what we're called to do as believers. Father, I thank you that you do draw us. That you don't just do it one time, but you continue to do it. That you don't force us, you give us the, the ability to say yes and to say no. And you promise us that when we say yes, there are things waiting for us. That there are things that 
There are works that you have for us to do. There's abundant life and blessing that is waiting for us. He promises that it's not always going to be easy, but that we can rest assured that, that our salvation is secure. And that the things that are happening are leading us to you. And Father, I pray today for the person that doesn't have that assurance. The day you're drawing towards salvation, I pray that day wouldn't be another day of saying no. There wouldn't be a day of saying, I've got this, because Father, we know that we don't have this. We're the ones that got our lives in the mess that they're in right now. Father, I pray today would be a day of salvation for that person. They'll respond to you in faith. I pray for those who have already made that decision that today would be a day in which we truly allow you to speak to us. We'll listen. We'll listen to how you see us. We'll listen to those areas in our lives that you're pointing out and saying, this needs to change. And Father, that today we would make the commitments that need to be made to saying yes to you better, to being conduits of the gospel better, to being used by you to draw men to yourself. Father, I pray that during this time of response, you would lead us in the way that, you, that, that we wouldn't deny. You would lead us in the way in which we know that you're here. You would lead us in the way in which we would have the courage that it takes to respond to you today. For all this in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand away from time of invitation?